Please remain standing as you are able as we hear the word this morning. I've invited Maddie Hopkins to please come. Uh, I have invited her to read our morning scripture. Christ didn't enter the holy place, which is a copy of the true holy place made by human hands, but into heaven itself, so that he now appears in God's presence for us. He didn't enter to offer himself over and over again, like the high priest enters the whole earthly holy place every year with blood that isn't his. If that were so, then Jesus would have to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. Instead, he has now appeared once at the end of the ages to get rid of sin by sacrificing himself. People are destined to die once and then face judgment. In the same way, Christ was also offered once to take on himself the sins of many people. He will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Thank you. I don't know, I love to hear children read scripture, don't you? I think it's such a blessing to to hear a childlike voice bring the very words of God to our attention and remind us of his presence and of his love and of all the promises that he has made us. And he is faithful. In a period of deep division and brokenness in our country, what difference could or would Jesus make? Where does the good news speak into the places that seem hopeless and lost? Do we live as if the weight and power of sin has already been taken away and that Jesus' sacrifice and love is available and intended for all people? Are we living that way? The scripture this morning from the book of Hebrews reminds us that Christ has done something for each of us one time, because once is enough. Today is the 100th, or shortly will be, the 100th anniversary of the Great War, the war to end all wars. The 11th day of the 11th month, and at the 11th hour, the war ended. American troops had made significant headway in 1918, rebuffing a German offensive along with the Western Front and moving Allied forces deeper into enemy territory. By November, Germany had had enough. It agreed to a ceasefire, signing the official armistice at 5 a.m. on November the 11th. The treaty took effect six hours later, again on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. The war to end all wars was over. Peace had returned to the world, but it didn't last, did it? Peace did not last. In in fact, we don't live in a peaceful world today. But I thought it was interesting in in some of, of my study this week that when the First World War was over, the leaders of the countries involved worked together on a treaty to make peace called the Treaty of Versailles. In the treaty, it was agreed that all of the Allied countries would award a medal to everyone who had served in the war up until 1919. Among the Allied countries were Great Britain, France, Russia, and America, but others were also involved. The medals were minted and awarded to veterans to honor their service and remember their sacrifice. But... Not long after being presented, though, the people began to notice the gold covering on the metal was flaking off, even just rubbing the metal to clean it would cause pieces to scale off in your hand. Because of this, many people felt at the time that it was not good enough for the people, for the brave people who had fought in World War I. The symbol paled to the sacrifice. The medal that pointed to a great victory lasted about as long as the peace that it had celebrated. Hebrews chapter 9 speaks of the earthly symbol that points to a heavenly reality. 
an earthly priest that points to our heavenly priest, and the animal sacrifice that points to the final sacrifice for sin. We're not really sure who wrote Hebrews and who it was written to, and we get some indication of why it was written, because it's a wonderful reminder of Christ being the final sacrifice, how the Old Testament sacrificial system was led us into this New Testament time of when Jesus would be sacrificed on the cross as the final sacrifice. At the heart of all of this, at the heart of all of Hebrews, is sacrifice. Just as the, at the heart of any war is sacrifice. Once a year, Israel had a Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It's already been celebrated this year by our Jewish brothers and sisters. It was an annual time for house cleaning, if you will. The tabernacle was cleansed, but it was cleansed with blood. The Holy of Holies was entered by the high priest at this time, only once a year to sprinkle blood on the ark and sprinkle on the mercy seat. While all of Israel waited for the priest to return, and then a scapegoat was chosen to carry the sins of the people. Yes, that's where we get the term scapegoat from. You're probably familiar with the term. It is blaming something or someone else for your faults. No political commentary here. Two goats were chosen by, a, a cast, by casting lots. One was sacrificed for its blood. The priest would then place his hands on the other, signifying the laying on of sins on the animal. And then a red cord was tied around the neck of the animal. And you find this all in Leviticus chapter 16. The animal was then driven into the wilderness to represent the sins being driven into the wilderness away from the children of Israel. This, this imagery in, in Hebrew speaks profoundly to what our perspective should be today, that, that we should have this self-sacrifice instead of this self-promotion, that we should see this contrast between imitation and reality and the end of futile attempts to deal with guilt and shame. In all three circumstances, we find victory over this world as we wait for the next. Last week, as we talked of dwelling places in this series on dwellings, last week we talked about dwelling in a place of hope. But we also dwell in a place of victory, and we must remember that. Reading this caused me to wonder, how did Israel know that the sacrifice was accepted for their sin? Never thought of that before, but as I read through Hebrews chapter 9, and, and, I, and then I go back to Leviticus and, and see what was asked of the people of Israel, suddenly something spoke to me, and, and I thought, well, how did they know that it was an acceptable sacrifice? How did they know that they were good for another year? I can hear Israel shouting into the wilderness, did that work? And God's saying, yeah, we're good. We're good. I don't think that happened. But how did they know? It then occurred to me how they knew to do these things, these rituals. In the first place, God told them. It's the same question we ask at times of ourselves. How do we know our sins are forgiven? God tells us in his holy word. Israel followed God's instruction and believed his promise. We follow God's instruction and believe his promise. Hebrews answers the question, am I saved? Maybe you've had a friend or family member that cannot believe that they have been saved of what they have done. Maybe deep in your heart you wonder yourself, am I saved? Christ is the final answer, and Hebrews tells us that. Was the sacrifice acceptable to God? Well, yeah, it was. It was his own son, the final sacrifice. We are victorious over the world by the blood of Christ. He gave his life, his blood, and a final display of God's love for us. And now we dwell in victory because of these three factors that I spoke of earlier, the self-sacrifice, the imitation that points to the reality and the end of guilt and shame. Is that good, God? Yeah, we're good because of Jesus Christ. Christ's singular self-sacrifice is a good, a good indication that God loves us. Jesus now enters the heavenly sanctuary. 
to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. The Old Testament tells us that the high priest was the one offering sacrifices for the people's behalf. Each year the ritual was followed so Israel would be reminded of the gravity of their sin. In a vivid display of death and blood and transferred blame, can you just imagine what it would be like during that time of the Old Testament when blood sacrifices were given and blood was sprinkled throughout the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies? Can you imagine witnessing the priest laying on hand on the the scapegoat and running it into the wilderness to signify sins and be taken away. Hebrews chapter 9, in Hebrews chapter 9, we're reminded Jesus is in the flesh, but he's the incarnate Son of God who has been made one with us and is one with God. Fully human, fully God. And God proves he is with us. He is the one that is one of us, and he desires for us to be perfect, just as he is perfect. So much so he gives the very sacrifice that is needed. We all die and face judgment. God's word tells us that. Yet Christ died and faced our judgment for us, and therefore gained us life. He bore our sins. Jesus is our scapegoat. He has taken away our sins. But he is so much more than that. He is our Savior, just as a simple metal couldn't compare to what it cost. An animal sacrifice can't compare to the final atonement. Jesus came for two reasons, to give and to gather. He came to give his life and to gather us, God's children. To give his life and to gather his saints. His sacrificial life brings us victory. And we also have to see this contrast in Hebrews between imitation and reality, why it is common for us to view blood as something to be cleaned up quickly before infection sets in or the transmission of disease. The blood of perfect animals was actually viewed as a means to atone, which means to cover sin and cleanse the instruments of ritual worship in the Old Testament. The difference between a copy and the real deal is that a copy has no, lasting, has no lasting effects, whereas what is real does, and we see the eternal effects. The earthly sanctuary, the tabernacle, is but a model of the spiritual sanctuary. Christ didn't enter the earthly model, but rather he entered the spiritual reality. Jesus entered the very throne room of the living God to speak on our behalf. Animal sacrifice is the model. Self-sacrifice is the reality. The sanctuary is the model. Heaven is the reality. A flag can represent a place, an ideology, a set of values, but the reality is the people. A medal can can commemorate a special event in history. But does it truly explain what was done and what was given. Everything but Christ is just as John Wesley describes it. Everything that we have in this world is just a shadowy representation. Christ is the reality. We dwell in victory because of Christ's self-sacrifice, the reality of what Christ has done, we, and because we are free, not from just sin, but from guilt and shame. And so that brings us to number three. Are you free of guilt and shame? Have you accepted Christ, but still feel as though the weight of the world's guilt is upon you? What is the significance of Jesus' sacrifice, his blood, for how we deal with our guilt? How we deal with our shame, in other words, how we deal with our sin. Very early in my ministry, I counseled with a young woman who had just started a family. She married and then Uh, immediately started having children, but she, in talking to me in private, went back to her teenage years. Did anybody here have teenage years? I had teenage years. And she said, I just don't know how God can forgive me for some of the things I've done. I just don't know how God can once again love me. And I said, God has never stopped loving you. And he has forgiven you because he's given his only son for you. And that's how we know 
That's how we get rid of the guilt and the shame. Because we know we can stand before Christ righteous. We can stand before God righteous. We no longer wait to see if the sacrifice is acceptable to God. It is his own son. We have victory over shame and guilt and stand before the Father in righteousness because of Christ. The wonderful truth here is that Jesus' ascension, or as Hebrews describes it, his entrance into the heavenly sanctuary means that we get to go there too. That we get to enter with him. He goes, we go. He is in God's presence on our behalf. Hebrews wants us to understand that he ascends to the heavenly sanctuary, the dwelling of God as our personal representative before God's throne. Brothers and sisters, we live in victory. We dwell in victory because of these three factors, because of the self-sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his example of how we are to treat each other. Because that we realize this imitation pales into the comparison of the reality of heaven and God's love. But still a good reminder of what we wait for. And it ends the guilt and the shame. Am I saved? Yes, you are in the blood of Jesus Christ. World War I was billed at the time of the war to end all wars. We know it didn't. Time marches on, memories fade, medals crumble, and history teaches us that war is inevitable in this life. We are reminded by Hebrews today that Christ is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. That heaven is a reality. And your guilt and your shame is over in Christ. As Christ said from the cross, it is finished. Three of the greatest words in the history of the church. It is finished finished. We dwell in a place of hope and in a place of victory. How can we be sure? It was bought by God's own Son. Let us pray. Father God, we are thankful for this reminder for coming to your sanctuary today and remembering, Father, that you love us beyond measure, that you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may live. And Father, we ask that you bless us in the coming week, that we have those opportunities to remember that our sin has been taken away, our guilt and shame is gone, we stand before you righteous in the blood of Jesus Christ, and we stand victorious. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.